All right, guys, you asked for it and you got it. Here is part two of the 1022 Survival Rifle Takedown Build Guide. And it's been more than a year, and I know that. And since then, I've had plenty of time to think about and refine the idea of a 1022 takedown as a survival rifle. And part of that refining process means that I was discarding certain upgrades that I had before and replacing them with more effective ones that have a more tangible effect on the performance of the rifle. Also, to make sure that I'm not just simply pimping out a gun for the hell of it, I've decided to make sure that every addition we make to this rifle enhances the gun's performance in one of three ways. One, performance, meaning it increases accuracy or reliability. Two, ergonomics. It has to increase the usability of the firearm. Now, whether that means increasing reload speed or simply making the gun more adjustable to different height shooters, in some way, it has to increase the ergonomics and make the gun more comfortable for the shooter. And third, fixing a fundamental flaw. The component has to address some fundamental flaw or shortcoming in the gun's core design. And lastly, none of these upgrades or attachments can prevent the gun from fitting in its original carry case. It still has to function as a takedown, handy little survival rifle. So with that in mind, let's dive right in to part two of the ultimate survival rifle build for the Ruger 1022 takedown carbine. All right, let's start off with the single most important aspect of any firearm, reliability. This is something I touched on briefly in part one, but not as in-depth as I should have. In fact, most advocates of the 1022 and 22s in general for survival or serious situations tend to neglect this lackluster trait. But it isn't limited to just Ruger's ultra-prolific carbine. See, in general, rimfire weapons aren't as reliable as their centerfire big brothers. This is due to a number of factors, the overwhelming majority of which are ammunition related. The two biggest contributing factors to this subpar reliability are feeding malfunctions and failure to fire issues relating to the primer. While there's no way for a product to fix rounds with non-existent primers, there are ways to mitigate rounds with inconsistent priming compound by achieving a more consistent firing pin strike. And one of the best ways I've found to address this and increase feeding reliability is with a tandem cross crossfire bolt. Machined from hardened steel, the crossfire bolt is designed to replicate the enhanced reliability of a hand-fitted bolt without the cost or wait time involved. It also incorporates a few unique upgrades that increase the carbine's overall reliability. Now, one of the ways the crossfire achieves this is by restricting the firing pin's vertical movement with a roll pin. On the original carbine, the firing pin channel features a small staked portion or extruded portion to do this. The problem is, after hundreds or thousands of rounds fired, this staked portion can begin to erode and no longer function correctly. Though truth be told, it doesn't really function all that well from the factory. In either case, this results in inconsistent primer strikes on rounds whose primer compound can often be unevenly spread, doubling down on the chances of a misfire. The pin employed by the crossfire lasts longer and can be replaced without having to replace the entire bolt. Other notable features of the crossfire include a precision machined bolt face to permit a more accurate head spacing, which itself results in more consistent primer strikes. Also, the bolt body is heavily polished to reduce bolt drag on the hammer, which increases bolt speed and thus feeding reliability. The Tandem Cross Crossfire Bolt is available on their website for around $150. And speaking of reliability, most higher capacity magazines for the 1022 are very hit or miss. Some are great, like Butler Creek Steel Lips and Hot Lips magazines, while others are less so, like the ones from ProMag. Now, after testing out several of these magazines, I found that Ruger's BX25 magazines are among the most reliable for the least amount of money. These 25 round magazines are built from a pair of clamshell, durable, rigid polymer halves connected with a pair of steel Allen screws. And since this is a survival rifle, I want to hold as many rounds as possible in the gun so I opted for the BX25X2 tandem magazine. This version of the BX25 features two 25 round magazines permanently stuck together jungle mag style. So reloading is a simple measure of extract the magazine, turn 180 degrees and reinsert. This allows for higher capacity without decreased reliability. Since higher capacity rimfire magazines tend to become exponentially less reliable after the 25 or 30 round mark. This is due to several factors, including increased 
magazine spring tension, compounding round friction, and of course, the dreaded rim lock. In fact, the only aspect of the magazine's design that I'm not thrilled with is that with the X2 model, there's not yet a translucent version. I would really like one of these since it would make checking the remaining rounds in the magazine much, much easier. Prices on these magazines vary dramatically. So shop around before buying one and look for the two packs that are sometimes available because they can often save you 10, 15, $20. Now, another issue I had with the first iteration of this build was the limited furniture options for the 1022 takedown. At the time of the first video, selection was pretty limited, but after the handy little carbine had been out for a while, eventually more and more aftermarket parts companies began building furniture for it. And while there are plenty of great options out there, I'm a guy with vastly more time behind an AR-15 than a 1022. So I wanted a rigid, durable chassis that permitted the use of AR-15 style grips and stocks, but did not double the weight of the gun itself. After looking around for a while, my research brought me to the PMACA 1022 lightweight chassis. This 16 ounce chassis is milled from 6061 T6 billet aluminum, so it's both incredibly light and exceptionally durable. It permits the use of AR furniture by incorporating the interface points needed directly into the chassis itself. Thus, the rear of the PMACA chassis is threaded for mill spec AR buffer tubes, and the bottom features a threaded hole for AR-15 pistol grip screws, as well as a bracket to accommodate the grip itself. Now, one interesting bit about the rear of the chassis is that it comes with a cadmium friction ring. This means that the interface doesn't need either the spring-loaded buffer retainer of the AR-15 or the receiver end plate to index the stock correctly. But a word of caution, do not sand this ring. Cadmium is extremely toxic if ingested and five times worse if inhaled. But thankfully, it's totally safe to handle, provided you don't try to grind it into a dust to put on your food. Additional features of the PMACA chassis include a forward Picatinny rail slot on the handguard for use with lights, lasers, or bipods. Also, shooters who want the PMACA chassis but only have a 1022 Ruger charger and don't want an NFA restricted firearm can utilize it with a pistol brace attached instead and still use that little short barrel without running afoul of the law. The entire chassis is extraordinarily well made and has really tight tolerances so the host rifle doesn't move at all inside of it. In fact, it might be a little bit tight the first time you try to install it, but just go slow and carefully, it does fit. Lastly, the entire chassis is secured by a pair of heavy duty Allen screws that in testing have held up flawlessly after nearly a thousand rounds fired. The PMACA lightweight chassis retails for $125 on the PMACA website. Now with that chassis installed, I went on to pick out some furniture options. For the grip, I went with a somewhat strange choice. The Brownells Retro M16A1 pistol grip. Made from durable, modern, high impact polymer, the A1 style pistol grip differs from the A2 in that it lacks that iconic finger shelf. I chose this grip because it fits my hands well and because the finger shelf on the A2 doesn't quite work with the PMACA chassis because the trigger sits at a different height than a standard AR-15. Also, the molded cross checkering on the grip works very well to help shooters retain control of their weapon should their hands become oily greasy or wet. As for the stock, I ended up picking the MFT Battle Link Minimalist stock. For an AR-15, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the Minimalist stock, only because I prefer the more pronounced cheek rest like those found on SOP mod stocks. But the PMACA chassis places the pistol grip closer to the buttstock along both the vertical axis as well as the Z axis. This means that full-size stocks will slightly impede access to the pistol grip when fully collapsed. The MFT Minimalist stock is designed differently though and doesn't get in the way at all. But that's not the only reason I chose it. In addition to its unique shape, the MFT Battle Link Minimalist stock incorporates some great features that make it well suited to survival use. For instance, the angle of the butt pad permits rapidly shouldering your rifle from a low ready position in a snap. Also, the rubberized butt pad helps keep the stock in a shooter's shoulder even if they're wearing a jacket made of a slippery material, like a rain jacket or something like a poncho. Other notable features include two sling attachment loops and a wide enough comb for comfortable use with optics. Plus, the stock is fairly affordable at around 50 bucks. Though more savvy shooters can certainly find it on sale for a few dollars less. All right, now we've got fully adjustable, mil-spec furniture and a more reliable bolt. That knocks out both reliability and ergonomics, right? Well, not quite. 
Another ergonomic issue I have with the 1022 in general is its charging handle. As someone who did not learn to shoot on a 1022 or any 22 for that matter, the layout of the carbine's controls feel awkward and unintuitive. The charging handle is located on the right side of the gun, which isn't a problem at the shooting range, but since we're talking about using the 1022 as a survival weapon, being able to keep the firing hand on the controls while charging the action could mean the difference between life and death. And since I wanted to utilize a Picatinny rail instead of a Weaver rail the carbine ships with, I again went to Tandem Cross for an upgrade. Enter the Advantage Charging Handle. The non-reciprocating ambi charging handle attaches directly to the top of the receiver utilizing four Allen screws. The handle itself is spring-loaded and sits just forward of the ejection port to avoid causing any ejection-related malfunctions. The Advantage employs a pair of steel guide rods and a one-piece charging handle that interacts with the original charging handle on the right side. The extra charging handle it adds is oversized for easier manipulation and does a better job of granting easy access when an oversized optic is used. This makes the gun both faster to charge and easier to clear malfunctions from should they occur. The Advantage retails for just under 100 bucks and again is for sale on Tandem Cross's website. But wait a minute, last time I didn't utilize a scope, so why do I need a Picatinny rail? Indeed, I was initially going with a set of tech sights as I believe them more reliable and durable than most optics. And while true, I found that with my aging eyesight, my ability to successfully engage targets with iron sights limited me to man-sized targets within 100 yards, and sadly often shorter than that because I'm functionally blind. This also eliminated choosing a reflex sight since their lack of magnification presents the exact same limitation on range. Instead, I went with a lightweight, high-quality, low-price optic. Nikon's P223 3x32 scope. This fixed power 3x magnification scope offers the perfect balance between increased precision by magnification while maintaining situational awareness with its wide FOV. I've likened it in the past to a poor man's ACOG, and that's a statement that I still stand by. For attaching to that tandem cross mount, I utilized a pair of Nikon scope rings for the optic. But really, a shooter can use any rings they prefer. But if my concern about durability was the limiting factor before, why do I trust this little Nikon? Well, this version of Nikon's P223 series of scopes has a fixed magnification. That means fewer moving parts, reduced weight, and increased light reception. And the fact that it has fewer parts means there are fewer things to go wrong. Also, it incorporates a nice BDC for 223 carbines, which in a pinch can be used for Kentucky windage style holdover with 22 long rifle. That, and I've used this scope on 5.56, 308, and even shotguns, and never had it lose zero, and never had any issues with the scope whatsoever. Just a nice, clear, affordable optic. The Nikon P223 3x32 scope retails for around 150 bucks. Well, that about wraps up my upgrades for the 1022 takedown, but there's one last thing that has always bugged me about the gun's design, the damn bolt release. If you're not familiar, when the original gun's bolt is locked back, the release must be pushed in while the bolt is retracted, and then released before the bolt can be released. This requires two hands and is, truthfully, needlessly complicated. Just like the charging handle I talked about before, it's not a big deal when at the shooting range. But just as I said before, this is supposed to be a survival rifle, one meant for serious work. Plus, with the takedown model, the bolt must be locked back to take it apart. So to remedy this, I installed a Tandem Cross Guardian bolt release plate. This plate is, truthfully, almost indistinguishable from a factory one, but has one great feature that makes it a must-have. It eliminates the need to press the release to unlock the bolt. Instead, a shooter simply pulls back on a bolt that is locked back and it flies forward into battery. It's a simple, easy to install solution that doesn't cost much, around $12. Plus, if a shooter needs to deploy their 1022 carbine from a backpack in a hurry, this removes one step and permits the shooter to keep their firing hand on the pistol grip as they install the barrel, insert a magazine, and chamber around, making it ready for action right out the gate. Now, before we wrap up the last of this, I wanted to address some of the comments I read in the first video. More than a few of you suggested that I replace the Innovative Arms Slingshot TI provided by Silencer Shop with an integrally suppressed 1022 barrel from Ruger itself. While inarguably more effective as a suppressor, the full-length can adds more weight and precludes the use of custom barrels. Plus, for me, I like the idea of being able to quickly remove and clean the suppressor without disassembling the gun. Since this is a survival rifle, I want to be able to keep the gun operational while cleaning the can. 
Another question I often saw repeated dealt with Magpul's PRS or whatever it's called stock for the 1022 takedown. The reason I didn't choose Magpul's stock on the first build was because it was clearly designed to only work with optics. And in the first build, we didn't use optics. But we're running a scope now, so why not run the stock now? Well, the reason I didn't use it this time is that I prefer a pistol grip setup for speed of use and how it allows me to utilize my other hand to interact with doors, light switches, etc., while keeping my primary hand on the pistol grip ready to fire. Lastly, I'm sure someone here is going to ask why the hell I kept the front tech sight installed. Well, there were two reasons. First, I wanted a quick shotgun style pointing bead sight for close range use should the optic fail. And second, I kept the rear tech sight inside the takedown bag along with a small screwdriver just in case. Look, at its core, it's still just a 1022 takedown carbine. Now these upgrades or enhancements do a lot to address a lot of the shortcomings, be that ergonomic or mechanical precision or accuracy or reliability, but it's still a 22 carbine. So if you're gonna use this for an end of the world or bug out situation, you have to be realistic about the terminal ballistics of 22 long rifle. Is it incapable of killing a person? Absolutely not. Is it gonna stop somebody in one shot 100% of the time? Absolutely not. You'll need precision, patience, and practice. And with those, you'll be very, very successful with this little carbine. And after all, practicing with 22 is still the cheapest way to learn basic marksmanship. Thanks guys. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that notification button down below for more burst reviews.